Well, welcome to Community Christian Church. My name is Ed Martin, and I am glad you're here to be with us today. You know, when you're watching somebody, if you get a chance to see what makes them angry, you learn an awful lot about a person. When, when something we care about, when it gets violated, uh, when something we, get, we love gets treated less value than it should, then uh, we sometimes occasionally lose it. I remember standing in a parking lot along with a whole bunch of other people watching a guy just go off, just rail at the top of his lungs about uh, this scratch on his car that I could barely see. Um, he talked about how inconsiderate people are and why nobody takes care of other people's properties the way they used to and what's happening to our generation and how his car is going to be ruined. And the, the whole time I'm listening to him with all these other people, I'm thinking to myself, man, I, I barely touched your car. Okay, I, I didn't really, I wasn't the one involved in it. I was watching like everybody else, but I thought that'd be funny. And when you drive a vehicle like mine, you're always suspect. Uh, when you hear what somebody gets angry about, you, you learn something about them. So what do you think makes God angry? What do you think God hates when it happens? You know, God loves everything that he creates. He Everything he created, he thinks is good, so when any damage is done to the stuff that he creates, he, he doesn't like that. So I can only imagine when we destroy a rainforest or there's a species he created and thought was good and we run it to extinction or we punch a hole in his ozone, that's probably not something God's really pleased about, but none of that makes it to the list of things that God hates. Instead, there is a list. There's a list in the Bible. There's an Old Testament book, one of the Earlier books in the Bible is written by a guy named Solomon, most, uh, Solomon, most of it, and it's a, just a collection of wise sayings of what he's noticed in the world. And in that list, he gives a list of things that God hates. Here's what he says. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes. Now, that's a word you don't use anymore. You don't go haughty. You, haughty just means you arrogantly look down on other people. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. You know, when we started this series way back in September, when we said we're going to study the whole of the greatest teaching of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mountain, a book called Matthew, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in, in the Bible, uh, one of the things we've been learning about primarily is that God has a kingdom. God has a kingdom. But more importantly, just as importantly, you have a kingdom. And that kingdom begins with your body where you have control over the things that you get to control. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but all of these things that are listed here, they're things to do with your body. It starts with uh, God hates a, a lying tongue. It God hates when there are promises made between people. When a spouse says to another spouse, I, I, I'll do that. When, when a politician lies to his people and deceives them. God hates when promises are made and then they're broken. God hates when you go into a restaurant and you, you value money over the person who's waiting on you and you arrogantly look down on them as somebody who their value is not as high as you or you see somebody of a different race or you see somebody of a different accent or you see somebody who talks or looks or is different than you, and you look down on them because of their background or their culture. God hates the lying tongue. He hates everything about that kind of thing. And then it goes on to things about our heart and our feet, and then it gets to the end, and there's this summary of the whole thing. It comes to just the person. Now, you probably noticed, maybe you did when we read this, that the writer uses this... Uh, this writing device, he says, there are six things the Lord hates, seven. It's not like the writer got in the middle of it and goes, oh, shoot, I wish I had an eraser. I meant there were seven, not six. It's just a Hebrew poetic device to add emphasis to what the last thing is. He's pointing out the last thing here. And the idea is not there's additional thought that he had. It's just this poetic way of saying, I want you to really notice the last one. And did you notice what it was? It's when a person violates community. It's when they destroy a relationship between people. God exists in perfect community. Father, Son, and Spirit existing in perfect harmony with each other. And then they create out of, of community. They create man. And man exists. God made them male and female. He made them in community. And we're to exist in community. And 
God hates when anything comes in and disrupts his community. He hates when lies get spoken. He hates when there are haughty eyes and we look down on each other, when we judge each other, when the innocent life of a child gets snuffed out, when the community gets violated. God hates anything that happens to violate that. And he hates when there's just, when there's just a world where even if you don't do it yourself, where you just see it, but you do nothing about it, where you say nothing about it, where you just say, that's the way our world is, and you close your eyes to it, and you shut your heart to it, where you just accept it. What God values, what over every other thing that he made, what God looks at and he says, that one thing is very good in, this, in all of creation. And this is just truth. This is just fact about our world. God values highly, more than anything else, human beings. So when he created human beings, when a, when a human being God created gets mistreated, it affects God very deeply. And this is just truth. When you all read all the history of the people of God, you know, God chooses a people, again, a community. And he says to this community, I'll make a covenant with you, and you'll be the one to deliver my truth, my message, my love to the world about how I care about all human beings. And he, he gives them the law, and this is what the law is about. It's about protection for human beings. And then there come the prophets. They, they bore a particular responsibility about truth for people and what God thought about people and how people were treating each other. And then one day there comes this, this rabbi, this teacher named Jesus. And he sits down on a hillside so that everyone can hear. And he lays out this great teaching, the Sermon on the Mount that we've been looking at. And very near the beginning of it, here's, here's what he says. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, those things that were given. I haven't come to do away with those. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Anybody that puts aside the least of them and teaches others to do the same will be called the least. And then this brilliant teacher, Jesus, he sits down and he summarizes in these, this teaching all the law and prophets. He gives us a summary of everything that God wants for us. He teaches us in a way that we can understand it. But even then, he isn't done. Jesus then boils all of that down to one great summary statement of how you treat exactly what God cares about, and that's where we found ourselves today. This is the greatest moral teaching ever given, he says. So in everything, do to others what you would have others do to you. For this sums up all the law and prophets. This is spiritual formation for every person. This is spiritual life for the rest of us. This is what Jesus means. And it really doesn't mean, it, it doesn't really matter whether you believe in God. It doesn't matter what you think about miracles or what you think about the Bible or what happened years ago or how the world got created. The, the golden rule, this, this teaching of Jesus, it, it gives you enough to do today to grow yourself. It gives you enough to do for the rest of your life. If you do this, this will keep you busy for the rest of your life. If you're experiencing homelessness on the street, if, if you were homeless, Jesus says, if you were homeless on the street, how would you want someone to look at you or, or not look at you? How would you want them to treat you or not treat you? If you're having a disagreement with somebody, if you're having an argument, and what does a golden rule argument look like? You take this teaching, Jesus is saying, I mean, part of the, part of the thing that makes the golden rule golden is that... We, we get to focus on how we're, how we're doing in our world. See, for most of us, when somebody says to us, hey, how's your day going? Normally, what we respond with is how we've been treated. What are the circumstances that have come toward us in, in, in this world? But the golden rule asks me to look at it a different way. I, I, would, I, would, I would want to respond, how's your day going? It would be, how have I treated people? How have I done it treating people? How, how am I doing with the people in my life? The golden rule is tremendously empowering because it takes me from looking at what has happened to me. I'm not a victim. It makes me an agent in my world. I'm active at doing something in my world. You know, every day is not going to be a lottery day. It's not going to be a great day where I win the lottery, but every single day can be a golden rule day if, if you want it to be. And you can use it with people that you live with. You can use it with people that you love. You can use it with people that you don't care that much about. And what you'll find over time that if you use the golden rule in relating to them, over time you will care about them more. 
You can use the golden rule while you're driving. You can use the golden rule while you're texting. You can use the golden rule by not texting when you're driving. You can use it to get across cultural divides. You can use it to get across political divides. You can use it in how you relate to our president because you love him. You can use it in how you relate to our president because you don't love him. You can use this in every single place to get across racial, cultural, age, gender divides. This is the way that you relate to everyone in your world. This is the golden rule. And the reason that the golden rule is, is golden is because, well... Really, it's not even a rule. I mean, rules are things like you, you, you can't drive more than 65 miles an hour. And I know that I've just raised it by 10 hours for most places because that's because I'm using my imagination. And that's, that's what this rule calls out. Most rules are just static. You know whether you're breaking them or not. But this one says, hey, use your imagination. Put yourself in the other person's place. Imagine what it would be like to be them in their place with their experience and then do for them what you would want them to do for you. Martin Luther, one of the great founders of the Protestant movement, the fathers of the church, said this about the golden rule. It was certainly clever of Christ to state it this way. The only example he sets is ourself. It's so clear that you don't need glasses to understand Moses and the law, Thus you are your own Bible, your own teacher, your own theologian, and your own preacher. Whatever you would have done to you, that's the rule. And the golden rule is where I place the other person on the same level as me. It's golden because I now look at me and every other person as being the same. That's not the way we normally look at it. They have desires and they have feelings and they have they have hopes and they have dreams about what's going to happen. It asks me to get outside of myself and to think about the other person. I try to imagine what it would be like to be them, to be from their culture, to be where they are, to live in my place. That person, that gender, what would that look like? The golden rule is, a, is golden because it now takes me and it, it moves me from getting inside of me to feeling, figuring out how I can do what I can to serve you, and Jesus uses. And if you begin to use it, if you begin to move it, it will move you from ego to love. It'll take me from focusing so much on me and what is happening to me to what I can do for the people around me. And if I do, I will grow. My spirit will expand. Jesus deliberately says, did you notice, in everything, in everything, do the golden rule. Well, how broad is that? What thing is not covered in everything? Well, of course, the answer is no thing. Every, everything is covered in everything. It, in, in a significant, in, in the ancient world, occasionally you came across other kind of rules, and you read other great texts of spiritual life, you'll see other rules that sound like this. For instance, there's the silver rule, it's been called, and that's the negative version of the golden rule, where it says, don't do to other people what you don't want others to do to you. But the golden rule is so much better for us and for our world. It, it calls me to action, not to passivity. It calls me to not withhold something, but to go and do something. I'm not just to avoid things. I'm not just to stay off of social media. I'm to do good in social media. I'm to do good in our world. I'm to engage with people that are different from me. It's an unlimited opportunity to take the initiative and creativity that God has put in me and to use it as a force for good in my world with other people. And not just that, it's universal. Jesus doesn't say, I want you to do this golden rule for the people you care about, for your, for your spouse and for your children and for the people you love. I don't want you just to do this for the people who look like you and talk like you and think like you and vote like you. I want you to do this for everyone, people that are near and people that are far, for your friends and for your enemies and for your frenemies and for everyone. This rule is for all. And then Jesus not only taught the golden rule and Jesus lived a golden rule kind of life. He lived the golden rule out. You know, if I were a leper in Jesus' day, and maybe you don't really understand leprosy, but it was this contagious disease that just ruined your life, and people didn't know how contagion spread, so they would just take these people and remove them, and nobody would ever touch them for fear of this disease that would destroy everything, so they, they weren't touched. If I were a leper in Jesus' day, the one thing I would want someone to do for me 
would be to touch me. But nobody touched lepers. But Jesus did. If I were a child in Jesus' day and children were so far down on the totem pole and and, and in some cases animals were above children and if I were a child in Jesus' day, I'd want to interact with the rabbi. I'd want to I want to be held by the rabbi. But rabbis didn't even notice children or talk to children. But Jesus did. If I were a prostitute in Jesus' day, I would would want somebody to, to see that I was still a human being, that I had dignity and worth. I wouldn't want them to judge me on the basis of what I'd done. But rabbis, they wouldn't even get close to prostitutes. But Jesus did. In the last moments of his life, when Jesus is dying on the cross, which we'll remember in just a few weeks, where he pays the price for everyone's sin. Jesus is hanging on the cross, dying a death that he doesn't deserve between two thieves. And one of these criminals turns to him and says, I've heard about your kingdom. And when you come into your kingdom, will you remember me? And, and Jesus doesn't say, man, how dare you? you? You lived your whole life flaunting your advantages against other people. And you, you, you didn't even care about God. And now in the last moment, you turn to me. Jesus doesn't do that. And he, instead, he, he golden rules the guy. He says, Today, you, you'll be with me in Paris, paradise. Jesus taught a golden rule message, and he lived a golden rule life, and he died a golden rule death. And in, then in his resurrection, Jesus launches this golden rule community, and it revolutionizes the world. The church changed the world, and it still does. I spoke to some of our leaders a few months ago about my great admiration uh, for this guy uh, named Fred Rogers. And many of you uh, know Fred Rogers, and I, I realized in talking to them about it that if you're maybe 20 and younger because he retired before you know anything about him, you wouldn't know Mr. Rogers. But Mr. Rogers, for generation after generation of children, was just a steady reminder of the love that, that people should have for every person, including little people. He was just as representative of Jesus on TV every single day. Now, many people don't know that Fred Rogers was an ordained minister. There's this wonderful documentary that came out last year. I've watched it a couple of times. I I understand just recently that I learned that Tom Hanks is going to play Fred Rogers in a movie about himself. But Fred Rogers was an ordained minister, ordained by his denomination, to be a representative for Jesus for children on TV. And every day he showed up and he lived out the golden rule for children. He taught them how to live the golden rule to each other. Near the end of his career, he receives a Lifetime Achievement Award, an Emmy for Lifetime Achievement. And I want you to notice, even in his acceptance speech, how he golden rules this acceptance speech. Let's watch this together. Oh, it's a beautiful night in this neighborhood. (laughs) So many people have helped me to come to this night. Some of you are here, some are far away, some are even in heaven. All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take, along with me, 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you become who you are? those who have cared about you and wanted what was best for you in life. Ten seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. (laughs) Whomever you've been thinking about, how pleased they must be to know the difference you feel they've made. You know, they're the kind of people television does well to offer our world. Special thanks to my family and friends and to my coworkers in public broadcasting, family communications, and this academy for encouraging me, allowing me, all these years to be your neighbor. May God be with you. Thank you very much. Hey, you and I know that in that moment of honor, he decided, how can I use my moment 
to honor others. But that moment didn't happen without him first thinking, who isn't going to be on this stage? They should be on this stage. And if I weren't on this stage, how would I want to be treated? We make life so incredibly complicated. I, I hear so much angst, and I remember being in this place myself where people go, I just want to, I want to figure out what I should be doing with my life, and am I doing the right things with my life? Do I have the right job? Have I married the right person? Do I have the right amount of kids? Do I get to have kids? I want to make sure my life is right so that I don't miss out on what is my one and only life. I tell you, any, any person who lives their life in the Golden Rule community and lives a Golden Rule life that not one moment of their life lived that way is ever wasted. No matter how much other people overlook it, that is never wasted. And no matter how impressive your life is and how many achievements you have and whether you have the right job and the right made and the right amount of children and everybody else is so impressed with you, your life lived not for the golden rule, it's wasted. You will have wasted your life lived another way. And I tell you, when you violate that, you violate what you were meant to be. In the book of Acts, there's this statement where Peter is trying to describe to a Gentile group of people who don't really have all the words of the people of God for him. He's a person who's grown up with all these words, and he doesn't know how to say. He wants to tell them about who Jesus was, and so he has to take it and put it in their words. And I, I love the way that he writes to them what Jesus' gold was. Here's the way he says it. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went around doing good. How much money do you have to have to go around doing good? How much IQ does it take to go around doing good? How much talent do you have to have to go around doing good? One of the great questions of life is, what are people going to say about me after I'm gone? What are people going to want to remember about me? How are all, is all of my existence on this planet going to be summed up? Peter's trying to describe his friend Jesus who he spent his life with and he wants to say to them what he was about and he said he just, he was anointed by God and he went around doing good. What, what does it mean to go around doing good? Whatever you'd have others do for you, you do for them. You live out the golden rule. Now, when we come together in the way that we are this morning, when Jason or Nathan or I, we stand up to teach. We don't teach so that you can understand things. Of course, we hope to help you understand what the Bible has to say, but our main goal isn't that we taught you some nuance that you didn't know, so you go, wow, or you write a note and you try to remember this nuance that you didn't. That is not our goal. Our goal is that you would actually do, you would do what we're asking you to do. Our goal is that we would become a community that didn't just know things, that we would, we would do what we're being taught to do. And this week, we're talking about the golden rule. So what do you think the application would be of the golden rule? Do the golden rule. Where? Wherever. Everywhere. To who? To everyone. How often? All the time. That we would be people who were golden rule people. We would go around. We would do good. And for the next few minutes, I just... With the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to try to make this as concrete as I possibly can. You should start at home. Start with whoever is right next to you, who is close to you. I, I just ask you, imagine if every home, if every husband and wife were, they were both golden rule oriented toward each other. Imagine if every mom was golden rule oriented toward her children, not about what they could do for her, but what she could do for them. What if every child were that way toward their parents? What if every argument, every disagreement in a home became a golden rule kind of disagreement? What can I help the other person get what they want out of this argument? Sin would virtually be done away with. Abuse would be gone. Neglect would be gone. Love would grow, and homes where the golden rule was lived out, where we follow the teaching of Jesus, would become the model that people would want to be a part of. They want to know how did that come about in that home. So begin by going around doing good and do it with the people that are absolutely closest to you. And then go from there to your friends. What would it look like to be a golden rule kind of friend? This, the week that I was actually 
working on this message. I, I have a couple of regular meetings, people that I meet with regularly for, for meals. I have a friend that I have met with now for breakfast of, oh, I don't know, probably nine, ten years. Every Wednesday we have breakfast together and we sit and we talk about life together and we try to encourage each other. I have another friend that I meet with at least once a month for breakfast and to try to do the same thing. And on this particular week when I was writing this, one of them was going through a particularly difficult time and that is his family had some aging parent issues and one of the parents had died and one was at the point of death and there was disease involved and, 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 and some of that kind of thing and the struggle that goes all around that and the tensions all around that. And it just hit me because I, I guess it should hit me all the time, but that week it hit me that I should, I should golden rule the conversation. I should say, what would I want someone to do in this conversation? What does he need to talk about? What, what does he need to hear? And I found myself as I actually began to to listen and to, to do that, I found I enjoyed the conversation more and the conversation seemed to flow more. And when it was time for us to leave, I reached out for the bill and then he reached out for the bill. And then there was this little bit of tug of war between the bill and we're going back and forth to try to get the bill so that we can pay for it. And I thought to myself, what would I want to do if I wanted to pay for the bill? How would I do that? So because I'm a golden rule person, I just let go. <laughs> you become a golden rule friend. What does my friend need? Not what do I need from my friend? How can I take my ego and put it down? And how can I love in this moment? How about it at work? What would a golden rule employee look like? And it doesn't really matter whether you get paid for your work or you volunteer for your work. We all have things that we've been asked to do. What would it look like to do that? Not with your focus on you, but on what you've been asked to do. What would it look like to give your best in that moment, for the sake of what you've been called to do? What would it look like to do for the person, for the company, what you would wish somebody would do for you? What would it be like to, to do that every moment of every day? You do that at home, and you, you do it with your friends, and you do it at work. You live out the golden rule. So this week, among those of us at Community Christian, those of us who joined in, let's make this an adventure in golden rule kind of living as we learn how we can relate better to people around us. This is the thing. And maybe you make it a competition and you keep score and you see how well you can do and can you outdo each other. That's actually a command in the Bible that we try to outdo each other in love and we creatively exercise the golden rule. And of course you'll blow it. Of course your ego will come back in. And then in that moment you receive from God what he knew that we needed from him. You receive grace and you get re-empowered and you get strength again to go back out and you begin to do good all around you. You don't beat yourself up. You live in that moment with a good God. As we approach Easter, maybe you begin to golden rule the people that are around you at work and neighbor and you begin to say, who is it that God would want me to bless? Who would God want me to bring to the celebration of what he's done for the world at Easter? Who could I invite? Who could I share this with? Who could I bring? And with Jesus' help, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, with the strength in him, you'll find that you begin to grow and you begin to change. And again, it doesn't really matter what you believe about this. If you begin to do, your soul will grow and you'll get a little more love and you will become a little more focused on the people around you and you become a little less self-preoccupied and you'll notice that fear goes down and worry goes down as you focus on others. And your imagination will begin to grow and stretch and grow and you will begin to do good for people all around you in all kinds of circumstances and you will discover that you have moments of joy that you did not know were possible because you were living the life in the kingdom that God intended for you to live. God's kingdom is real and is here. It's available to you. You can learn that you can do life with Jesus in that moment. In fact, in fact, in fact, the golden rule under Jesus is so strong and available that what we want to do to close today is we want to just give you space to do that. You might notice that I'm going to be a little bit shorter today because this is a golden rule kind of message where I'm going to do for you what I think you would want me to do. We're going to ask you to leave right now and do the golden rule. 
And we're going to end sort of abruptly. We're not going to sing another song. We're not going to pray a prayer. We're just going to ask you to go and respond appropriately to this message. And then you'll have time to do the golden rule. And you can do it right now. There are people sitting around you. I want you to begin to notice right now who is around you and begin to think for yourself, what would they need? If they're newer here and and you can tell they don't really know anybody, what would you want somebody to do for you if you were new and everybody else looked like they were already friends? Maybe in that moment you could begin to reach out and share love with them. You can do it for somebody who's going through a hard time. And there are plenty of those in our community as well. And you could look out and you could could pray for them. You could pray with them. You could ask them how they're doing and you could genuinely listen. You can do the golden rule in the next few minutes before you walk out of this room. And then when you walk out of this room, you can smile at somebody and you can golden rule in that moment and you get in your car and you can drive a golden rule kind of day. You can do the golden rule. So that's how we're going to end. I say to you, go and do for others what you would have them do for you. Seriously, why are you still here? Go, do the golden rule.